former Christian and a member of Tacoma's atheist community that has welcomed me into their midst and, and been very generous to share Derek with us and support him by coming out today to listen. I do a sermon every single week. It's a lot of work. It's emotional work. Because writing a sermon causes me to change it challenges me in my beliefs. And so when I thank Darren for coming, like I'm about to do, I want y'all to know that I'm thanking him for that, for really putting his heart into this, and for, and for inviting that kind of change in his life. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I want to thank all of you for coming out to this little experiment we're doing here. Um, I know it might be a, seem a little weird, an atheist giving a sermon in a Christian church, but I'm not sure how it's going to go, but let's just go ahead and find out. When you first heard that an atheist was going to be speaking here today, what did you imagine that person would be like? Did you think they would be angry, either at God or at organized religion in general? That's what I thought when I was a Christian, so I could understand if you thought that as well. Or maybe you thought I would be a cold, somewhat emotionless person who could never understand the personal relationship that you have with Jesus. That seems reasonable. Maybe you know an atheist like that. Or maybe you've seen one portrayed in a movie. However, if your views about atheists are based on movies like God's Not Dead, or anything starring Kirk Cameron, <laughs> I don't know any atheists like the atheists that are in those movies. And what did you think I would talk about? Maybe about the harm that religion has done in the world? Or about the parts of the Bible that don't sound real? Or the parts that contradict each other? Well, if that's what you were hoping to hear today, I've got some good news for you. And some bad news. The good news is that the internet is full of stuff like that. And when you get home, you can get on the computer and look it up. The bad news is that I'm not going to be covering any of that here today. Instead, today, I want to talk to you about love. I want to talk to you about accepting people and about how losing my religion has affected my ability to love and accept people. But first, I want to tell you a little of my origin story. I was born into a conservative Christian family. I, I grew up going to an Assemblies of God church down in Centralia every Sunday. I was taught that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and I didn't question that. Something that seems to be true of most of us is that we accept the reality of the world in which we are presented, and that was certainly true for me. It wasn't until my mid-twenties that I started to really take being a Christian seriously. I was living just outside of Stone Mountain, Georgia, and I was a member of a conservative evangelical church. On one particular Sunday, I remember feeling that the Holy Spirit was moving me to rededicate my life to Christ. And that is what I did. I became very involved with the church. I taught in Sunday school classes. I volunteered whenever and wherever the church needed me. Eventually, I found myself teaching in the school that was run by the church. It was Northside Christian Academy. While there, I was studying the Bible every day. And I was also beginning to fall in love with the beauty of science. I was going through books by Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking and others as fast as I could get my hands on them. 
and the scientific worldview was starting to make more sense to me, I still believed that the Bible was inerrant. But I also believed that science and the Bible would be perfectly aligned if they were both understood correctly. So this is the part of my sermon where I had originally planned to take you through the steps that led me to my deconversion. But I'm not going to do that here today. I will tell you that there are a lot of things in the Bible that I was struggling to believe. And it wasn't because I didn't want to believe them. I had a prayer closet, a literal prayer closet, that I knelt in every night, and I begged God to help me understand how the world presented in the Bible, and the world as I was coming to understand it, could fit into the same reality. Over time, these parts of the Bible began to feel like weights that I believed I had to carry if I wanted to keep my faith. And nearly every day, it felt like more weight was being added. This sounds like a joke now, but I remember thinking at the time that the parts of the Bible I was struggling to accept were the actual cross that I had to bear to remain a Christian. So there he was, teaching at a Christian school, where we are telling the students that every story in the Bible needs to be accepted as historical fact. But I wasn't just having trouble understanding how all of these stories in the Bible can be shown. We were also teaching kids that homosexuality is a sin. I was teaching kids that homosexuality is a sin. And I knew that that didn't make sense to me. Why would being attracted to someone who happens to be the same sex as you be a sin? I knew gay couples could be in loving relationships the same way straight couples could. How could love be a sin? We were also teaching these kids that anyone who wasn't a Christian would go to hell when they died. And I was having a lot of trouble with that. In the history of the world, nearly everybody ends up believing in the religion their parents believed in. How could someone go to hell if their sin was being born to the wrong family? How could God be loving if most of the people throughout history ended up in hell? And if it wasn't for the fact that I was teaching children these ideas, I probably could have just gone on believing the Jesus part of the Bible, and not thinking too much about the rest of it. But I was teaching children. And that's the thing that I regret the most. More than anything else I've done in my life. I'm not teaching them that the stories in the Bible were true. I don't care too much about that anymore. What I regret is teaching these kids that there's something wrong with people who are gay, with people from other religions and those who have no religion. I was teaching them to believe that anyone outside of our own brand of Christianity was broken. That outsiders needed to be fixed. I was teaching them to put up walls between themselves and those they view as other. And I did so even though I knew it felt wrong. And I justified doing so with verses from the Bible. One day, I had what alcoholics refer to as a moment of clarity. I realized that I hadn't been looking at the Jesus story with the same critical eye that I had been applying to the rest of the Bible. And again, I'm not here to try to get you to stop believing in Jesus or the Bible or whatever. But I do want to tell you that to me, when I looked at the evidence, it was not strong enough for me to continue to believe and the divinity of Jesus any longer. And when I finally let go of my belief in the divinity of Jesus, what happened was those beliefs that I had been such a struggle for me to continue holding on to, they just slipped away. And for me, that was such a relief. 
It felt like I had been holding on to two ropes, one tied to my belief in Jesus and the Bible, and the other tied to how I saw the world and what I viewed as accepting and loving people. And when I let go of the rope that was tied to my belief in Jesus, I suddenly realized that I didn't need to hold on to the other rope either. If someone happened to be gay, I could just accept them as they are. If someone was a Muslim, a Hindu, an atheist, whatever, I stopped viewing them as needing to be fixed. And it was only then that I realized the kind of barrier a belief like that puts between people. I realized that for me, when I was a Christian, the fact that I viewed non-Christians as other made it nearly impossible for me to accept them as they are, to love them as they are. When I was a Christian, so much of what I did for those outside of my community was done in the form of outreach. And in some ways, that was similar to love, but there was one big difference. Love doesn't have an agenda. It isn't a tool to be used to get people to buy what you're selling. What I understand now is that something amazing happens when you love people without an agenda, when you accept them without trying to convert them. No, they don't convert. But somehow the world starts to look like a more beautiful place. Not because other people have changed, but because you have changed. So I want to ask all of you here today, are there any beliefs that you are holding on to that are getting in the way of your ability to love people, to respect people, to accept people as they are, to think of everyone as equal? So ask yourself, who are the people that you think of as other? Is it atheists? People from other religions? Maybe those who are part of the LGBT community? What about people with mental health issues? Or those with de developmental disabilities? Maybe it's someone from a different political party. I don't know who you think of as other, but I believe it is something we should all think about. And I want to ask you, is it okay to love these people as they are? without an agenda, without trying to save them. Finally, I want to leave you with an example of what this kind of love and acceptance looks like. When your pastor invited me to speak here today, she didn't try to tell me what I should or shouldn't say. She accepted me as I am. She trusted me to share something of value with you. And I think that is the kind of love and acceptance we can all strive for. Thank you, Abigail. And thank all of you for coming out to listen today. That's, that's all I got for you folks. Thank you.